When Ram launched the fifth generation 1500 a number of years ago, I said it was my favorite half ton truck. But a lot has changed since then. General Motors finally gave their trucks the interior they always deserved. We have a significantly refreshed F-150 with a lot of different drivetrain options. And of course we have the new Toyota Tundra, which has an available hybrid system, something that is still not offered on this Ram 1500. But for 2025, Ram has made some pretty significant changes to their truck. Are they enough, however, to put this back at the top of the list? Let's find out. Ram is calling the 2025 1500 a fifth generation Ram, so they haven't changed a lot of the structure of the truck, but we have new engines and a new look. Starting here with the Bighorn trim, this is not the base version, this is one step up from there. We have a unique grille in most of the trims, and different headlights depending on the trim level you're looking at. Since this is one of the lower end Ram 1500 trims, we have reflector LED headlights. LEDs are actually gonna be standard in every Ram 1500 for 2025, but you'll have the choice of reflectors or projectors depending on the model. If you have at least $87,000 burning a hole in your pocket, you might wanna take a look at a top end trim of the Ram 1500. This is the new tungsten trim, and it definitely gets a visually differentiated front end. But before we dive into this one, let's talk about the rest of the lineup. Obviously the front end design is gonna change based on the trim level you choose. The Ram Rebel still has the sort of handlebar mustache, frowny face thing going on, but it's a little bit less frowny than before, and every version is gonna be a little bit smoother, a little bit more aerodynamic. But back to this tungsten trim. You'll notice when you compare this to the other models, it looks distinctly different. And that's not just because of the different grille, but also because of the headlights, the fog lights, and the big bumper here. We get projector LED headlights, projector multi-module LED fog lights, and if you notice, this is a one-piece plastic aero bumper. It doesn't have a separate steel bumper, although there is still a steel bumper beneath the plastic. This may come as a surprise to some of you, but yes, Ram will continue selling the Ram 1500 Classic right alongside this refreshed fifth generation truck. That model has been on sale for 16 years and it's still on sale for a good reason. Ram decided not to create a regular cab long bed version of the fifth generation Ram 1500. When you look at this from a business case perspective, it makes a lot of sense. Not too many people are buying two-door long cab trucks, and those that do generally want really stripped down trucks. They are looking for a more affordable truck, a more utilitarian truck, and that's exactly what we find in that Ram 1500 Classic. It also saved money because they didn't have to design a new single cab version that would only sell in really tiny numbers. Now, we don't know what the future holds for the Ram 1500 Classic. Will it continue for 2025? What engines will we find under the hood? They haven't answered that particular question yet. A feature unique to the Ram 1500 continues to be the available four corner air suspension. It's standard in the top end trim and optional in practically the entire lineup. This has a number of advantages versus a regular steel spring setup. We started out at the lowest ride height, which means it's gonna be easier for people with mobility issues or kids to get in and out of the vehicle. Also potentially easier to park in your garage if height is a bit of a concern. But we also have the ride quality improvements. This is the best riding half ton truck in this segment in America, absolutely hands down. And we have general dynamics improvements when we're talking about payload or towing near the maximum capacity of the vehicle. Because this adaptive air suspension can keep the suspension right in the middle of its suspension travel. So you still have as much compression and rebound available, and that really improves handling dynamics, especially in evasive maneuvers. Now, when it comes to the off-road capability, we're now in the off-road to ride height mode. That improves clearance over the front differential because it is an independent suspension up front and it improves the approach, departure, and breakover angles of the Ram 1500, but it does not improve clearance in the rear. And that is because this is a solid axle in the back. So the adaptive air suspension is simply lifting the body off of that axle in the rear. It cannot relocate the rear differential. Since this is a refresh, not a redesign, the majority of the sheet metal does not change for 2025, but we do get some light changes. And I am sad to see that the amber turn signals that we used to find in the Ram 1500 are gone. We just have red turn signals on each side. Again, this is the Bighorn model. And because this one has the base 3.6 liter V6, it has exhaust tips that are tucked up underneath the metal bumper in the back. Moving back to the tungsten trim, you can see that we have the same taillight modules, a very similar bumper down there, but twin exhaust tips. Ram is very proud of the fact that this is a true dual exhaust. So right from one turbocharger all the way back here to a single tip, although there is a crossover box in the exhaust system there. We have finally a power tailgate. It's power up and it's power down, but if you prefer the Ram barn doors in the back, you can still get those. You just hit that button there, 
power tailgate powers itself right back up. And in case you're wondering, the popular Rambox cargo option continues. This basically trades extra space inside the bed for this lockable storage space on either side and more of a square or rectangular cargo area in terms of the bed itself. These are definitely a handy feature that I would get on my Ram 1500 because these storage areas are pretty deep, they're pretty square, and they feature drain plugs down there at the bottom so you can even use them like a cooler if you want to. We'll talk about pricing in greater detail at the end of the video, but you should know that the base price of the Ram 1500 has gone up for 2025. And part of that is because we find more active driver assistance tech than we had last year's standard. Adaptive cruise control, lane centering, autonomous emergency braking with pedestrian detection, blind spot monitoring that is trailer aware, rear cross traffic detection, front and rear parking sensors, and rear autonomous emergency braking are all standard on every Ram 1500, including the tradesman model, with the urethane steering wheel. You can also get a ton of available safety systems and driver assist systems, like a 360 degree camera that's available or standard on every trim except for the tradesman model. You can also get evasive steering assist, so if the autonomous emergency braking system thinks you're gonna hit something and you start to try and steer out of the way, it will assist you in steering out of the way. There's also an intersection autonomous emergency braking assist system, driver drowsiness detection, and hands-free driving, which is quite a mouthful. Basically, their hands-free driving system is like Super Cruise or Blue Cruise. We haven't been able to test it just yet in this model. Hopefully, I will a little bit later in this video, but you should know that's only going to be on mid-level and upper-level trims, so you'll probably be able to find Blue Cruise on an F-150 for a little bit less. For many of you, a pickup truck without a V8 engine is like a pencil without lead pointless. But let's talk about this 3.6 liter V6 before we talk about that V8's replacement. This is a 305 horsepower V6 producing 271 pound-feet of torque in its own right, but the interesting twist is that a mild hybrid system is standard on this V6, and that bumps torque up by 90 pound-feet of torque under the right conditions. That's thanks to a 9 kilowatt electric motor that's bolted onto the front of the engine and a just under half kilowatt hour lithium-ion battery pack on board. For the pointless crowd, here's some numbers that might put some lead back in your pencil. The 3 liter twin turbo inline 6 is going to start at 420 horsepower, 469 pound feet of torque, and you can get that engine optionally even in the base tradesman model. That gives you 25 more horsepower and 58 more pound feet of torque than the outgoing 5.7 liter engine, and it's one of the most powerful engines in the half ton segment, period. If you want more power, you want this high output version. That bumps things up to a whopping 540 horsepower, 521 pound-feet of torque. The only half-ton pickup truck that is more powerful than this is the Raptor R at 720 horsepower. The one thing an inline six can't do is sound like a V8. So let's check out this exhaust note. It definitely sounds like a throaty BMW, to be honest. Rather than slashing options and streamlining the lineup like we see from some of the competition, Ram is expanding the lineup with even more drivetrain options than before. We have three different axle ratios to choose from and three different transfer cases depending on the trim level and the engine you choose. The base four-wheel drive system is pretty self-explanatory. It's a part-time system, so you get rear-wheel drive or you get four high and four low. The next one, also pretty simple, it's a full-time on-demand system pretty similar to what we find in the F-150 and the Silverado for the most part. There's a four auto mode, so the system will engage the front axle whenever it's needed, but it will spend most of its time in rear wheel drive mode. The most interesting transfer case is the one found on the high output equipped models. This is an active torque split full-time four wheel drive transfer case, conceptually pretty similar to what we find in the Grand Cherokee. It has the ability to split torque 25% front, 75% rear, or 50-50 front rear. Of course, you can also lock it, and it also has a four low mode, but as far as sure-footedness on ice, on snow, slippery surfaces, etc., this really is going to be the best in the segment because it doesn't have that sort of harsh engagement that four auto sometimes can have in the competition since this is always sending some portion of the power to the front axle. Since 2025 is more of a refresh than a redesign, the bulk of the interior is the same. So legroom and headroom figures, those are the same as the 2023 model year. But on the inside, we have a significant change to the dashboard and to the seats in this top end trim. Since this is the tungsten trim, of course, we have tungsten right there on those front seat backs. And we definitely have a front seat design that's more Wagoneer or Grand Wagoneer than Ram 1500 of the past. 
Because there's now so much adjustment on the front seats, they've moved the seat controls up here to the doors. We also find the controls for the active seat massage functionality there as well. And interestingly, you don't have to get this top end tungsten trim in order to get the front seat massage. There's actually the less adjustable seat with the seat massage as well. This one has an extending thigh cushion. We also have an adjustable curvature to the seat back and of course adjustable lumbar support as well. There's so many different ways to adjust the seat that they put a number of the seat controls here in the infotainment system, like lumbar up, down, in, out, the back bolsters, the thigh bolsters, etc., and of course, the seat massage functionality. Another feature borrowed out of the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer is this passenger side display. You can see that it takes the place of the small glove compartment that would normally go there, and it does have a prism inside, so that way the driver can't see it. So you can see from that angle, it just appears black, from the passenger side, you can actually use it. Uh, the one thing I will say about this display though is that you can't CarPlay or Android Auto on it, and that I find a bit of a bummer. You can watch shows on there if you have something connected via the HDMI port, but I don't find it quite as useful as I think it could be. You can see that in this tungsten trim, we have lots of premium materials on the dashboard, lots of stitch materials, contrasting piping there, more stitch work going on up top, the Klipsch Audio System logo right there leather down here on this section of the dashboard really dresses it up rather than the hard plastics you find in the other trims and even some stitched leather right here along the center console for your knees to rest against we still have the big bin style compartment right there back on the doors lots of stitched leather going on there leather inserts at the top of the door the middle of the door the armrest right there but as you'd expect in a truck there are also hard plastics lower than that to help improve durability now, going back to the center of everything, this may look very similar to the screen in the Bighorn model we were in earlier, but it is in fact a larger display. So the buttons are slightly different over here on the side because this is a 14 inch screen, not a 12 inch screen. The software, that's basically the same, and the physical controls are basically the same on the side. They just shrink down a little bit because of that larger screen size. Over here on this side, we find the controls for the four-wheel drive system, also the shifter there, trailer brake controller down there. Again, tons of USB ports. Since we have the passenger screen, we have some extra ones over here. We have some USB charge only ports and the passenger HDMI input port. The rest of the center console area, it's basically the same, except that we have the tungsten badge right there. And then over on the driver's side, we have a full color LCD instrument cluster. Sorry, the uh, camera picks up far more glare than the eye does, but it is a highly configurable display. It also has some mixed mode displays that are very similar to what we find in the Jeep Grand Cherokee. Hopefully I'll be able to have one of these at home so I can demo that a little bit more. One thing that surprised me though, we still have a manual tilt telescopic steering column, not a powered unit, but in this model, we do get a leather wrapped airbag cover, which I think really dresses up the driver's side experience. Same buttons right there on the steering wheel as the other models, of course. One of the interesting things about the tungsten trim is the attention to detail and the high level of parts quality. For instance, not too many vehicles out there have a full leather back to the seat, and this is one of the few. This is not a hard plastic backing like we find in other vehicles with a leather front. So stitched leather going on there, and center channel speakers for the rear passengers because this has that 1200 watt Klipsch audio system. As before, the rear seats flip up, so you have access to a little bit of cargo space right there under the seats, and then we have the little storage bins on either side that we've seen from Ram for a while. Front and rear seat headroom are both excellent in this model. You can see up here on the ceiling, we have yet more clips speakers right there. You won't get those bumps if you don't get that top end audio system. And we have this big panoramic moonroof that for some reason we don't find in all half ton trucks in America. Now let's check out the limited trim. This has a two-tone charcoal and burgundy interior color scheme. You can see lots of stitched components in here. It's stitched on the upper section of the door, stitched leather dashboard, stitched midsection of the dashboard, and the passenger side LCD right over there. One really interesting touch is the upholstery. Rather than just leather, we have a combination of leather and cloth right there with some different stitching than we find in the other trims. Limited trims get real wood trim over here on the dashboard and on the doors. We have the larger of the LCD infotainment systems here in the middle. And as you can see, we have the massage functionality on the front seats, even though these are not the most adjustable seats. So instead of the seat controls going on over there on the doors, the seat controls are on the seats, but we have a massage button on the doors. There's also some limited badging on that center console storage area. There's a view across the driver's seat right there with the seat controls on the seat itself, including four-way adjustable lumbar support. The steering wheel, that's leather wrapped, but we don't have the leather airbag cover we find in the top trims. And then we have the full LCD cluster over there. Over here on the dashboard, you'll notice we have this big cargo slot right there, not covered or anything like that, but we still have 
a glove box right over there. And we now have the eight and a half inch approximately touchscreen infotainment system. It's the smallest screen in the lineup. It's better integrated into the dashboard than before, and it's now running the latest Uconnect software. So they didn't stick this with an older generation. We still have lots of physical buttons down there. We still have the trailer brake controller with the trailer steering function right over there. The ability to turn off the front and rear parking sensors independently. You'll find the shifter over here and lots and lots of USB ports right down there. There's also a big storage cubby that comes right out of the dashboard. I find that a really handy feature. And then we have some storage right there and a sixth seat belt because this does have a bench seat up front. You can also pull this little handle, fold that down, use that as a center armrest and cup holders if you want. Over on the driver's side, we have a partial LCD instrument cluster, basically tiny little LCD right there in the middle, and log dials over there on that side, urethane steering wheel, push button start right over there, and very much the same controls that we find in the rest of the lineup. Adaptive cruise control controls over here on this side, the gear limit switches right there, and then the controls for that multifunction LCD cluster. The dashboard, the style is basically the same as the others, but we find less premium materials. Hard plastics all the way around, essentially the entire upper portion of the dashboard is all made from hard plastics, so no soft touch, no stitched leather, obviously. We then have the headlight controls over here, and then you can see that this is a fully manual driver's seat design. All right, let's get the Hurricane out on the road. After about 2000 RPM, this is definitely not a Tempest in a teapot. There is an awful lot of power. And the exhaust note is actually a little bit better under acceleration than it is at idle. You don't quite get a crack and a pop out of the exhaust, but it actually sounds pretty darn close. Now, much like I noted in the Wagoneer and Grand Wagoneer, if I come back to a complete stop here in Florida again, you will notice just a hint of turbo lag. So maybe about half a second there, and then everything comes on the boil, and then you will notice there is just a ton of power. This is really kind of an interesting twist for the Ram 1500 because the 5.7 liter V8, I, I always kind of wondered why they didn't give the Ram 1500 the 6.4. I guess the answer is they were just waiting for this hurricane because 540 horsepower is more than the 6.4 392 engine had ever delivered. And it's honestly more than we find in all the competition except for that Raptor R. This is above the F-150 hybrid. It's more than we find in the regular Raptor. It's more than the 6.2 liter V8 we find in the Chevy and the GMC. I wasn't able to do my own official zero to 60 runs out here. Obviously I'm not at sea level. I don't have my equipment with me, but some other people I know were able to get 4.7 seconds time after time in this exact truck. And that doesn't surprise me at all because we just get heaps and heaps of power. One of the things I noticed immediately, in addition to the incredible thrust, is just how quick and crisp these transmission shifts are. And then there's just the entire sensation combined. We get that three liter inline six twin turbo engine, the fast shifts from this German automatic transmission. You kind of think, am I in a BMW? And that's not quite as crazy as you might think just on the surface of it, because what else has a three liter twin turbo inline six engine and a ZF8 HP 75 transmission? Insert a solid number of BMWs into this conversation because this is exactly the same formula going on in something like a BMW M3. What kind of a weird, crazy world do we live in where BMW M3 and Ram 1500 have something in common? Obviously, this big, heavy American truck is not gonna drive like a BMW, but it is one of the best handling and one of the best riding half-ton trucks in America. And a lot of that is down to the rear suspension design. Instead of using leaf springs like we find in most half-ton trucks in America, this uses coil springs in the back. And that really means that the rear suspension is much more settled over broken pavement. For daily driving, for highway driving, for mountain carving, etc., this is going to feel a lot more sorted than anything with leaf springs in the back, even if you don't opt for the adaptive air suspension. I should mention that although the air suspension is fantastic and it's offered in essentially every trim of this vehicle, you should know that long-term maintenance costs are going to be higher than if you simply chose the regular steel spring suspension. So if you're really on the fence about that, you might want to choose the less expensive option long-term, even if you're willing to pay the upfront costs of getting that particular option certainly something that you should keep in mind. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to cabin noise test this out here in Texas, but I suspect it's gonna be one of the quietest entries in the segment. Clearly, we're gonna get less engine noise into the cabin because this three liter inline six is just quieter by its nature than the 5.7 that it replaces. You will still hear the engine, of course, when you rev it up, and the engine noises aren't gonna be quite as pleasing as the V8. I am the first one to admit that. I love the way a V8 sounds. But I think that I'm willing to give that up for the extra power, the extra torque, and the better fuel economy that we're going to get out of this engine. 
Speaking of fuel economy, that's a little bit difficult to talk about because of course we've been driving this on-road, off-road, etc. But you should expect probably about 20 miles per gallon in daily driving as long as you're pretty gentle on the throttle. I'm going to go ahead and reset our trip computer now and at the end of this drive section I'll just go ahead and put our fuel economy score by the time we get back to the hotel which is in about 40 miles. If you're wondering how well the hands-free driving assistant works, I decided to put this in a separate video because it's a bit to explain. So if you want to know about this hands-free driving experience, I am actually driving on I-35 right now completely hands-free, be sure and click over to that video. You'll find a link down there in the description. All right, it's time to get a trailer out on the road. I'm driving the regular tune of the inline six turbo. There is a solid amount of pull here and not as much turbocharger lag as I had expected. You'll definitely find more turbo lag in the F-150, even in the three and a half liter V6 in my opinion. This has a really good amount of low end pull, especially just as you'd expect with those really enormous torque numbers. Now, there are a few things to keep in mind. The first thing is, for my final opinions on towing, you're gonna need to wait until I can get this back at home because this trailer is not as heavy as it could be. The GVWR on this one's about 7,300 pounds. Once I find the actual curb weight of this trailer, you'll see that on your screen, but I'm gonna guess it's maybe 6,000 to 6,500 pounds tops. If you live in a mountainous area, you should keep in mind that turbocharged engines like this are not going to give you as much engine braking as a larger displacement naturally aspirated engine. That's really something that I notice in the area of the country that I live in. Even if I were to put this in second gear and this engine's revving its nuts off at nearly 6,000 RPM, there's not a lot of engine braking down this gentle slope here. And that's simply due to the displacement of the engine. It's not gonna be substantially different in the Ford F-150, although I suspect the three and a half liter V6 in that model might give you just a hair more engine braking. I would say if you're really concerned about engine braking, if you do live in a hilly area, if you find yourself driving from the Bay Area up to Tahoe, if you live in Colorado, et cetera, you may want to consider one of the naturally aspirated V8 competitors while they still exist. Also, you might want to consider something like the inline six turbo diesel that we find in the General Motors trucks. Even though that has the same displacement as this because it's a diesel engine with an actual exhaust brake, it has a solid amount of engine braking capability. On the other hand, I am definitely impressed with the amount of power we find from this engine. I'm just gonna accelerate from a stop here in a straight line. Just the barest hint of turbo lag until maybe about 1200 RPM, and then we just get gobs and gobs of torque. Towing with the new inline six is definitely gonna be a different experience than towing with the old V8 engine. We get more torque at lower RPMs than the old V8, but you get a little bit less ability to help control the speed of your combination trailer and truck going downhill. So you're really relying more on your trailer brakes. So definitely make sure your trailer brakes are in good shape and really keep an eye on overheating if you're on a longer downhill run, say going down the Continental Divide or going from Tahoe back to the Bay Area. One thing worth noting, however, is that if you are interested in towing those heavier weights, we do have the upcoming Ram Charger, which could be a really interesting twist here. Because the Ram Charger has a big battery pack, it theoretically should be able to give you incredible amounts of regenerative capability back into the battery going downhill, and that means it could actually have much better control over a trailer than the outgoing 5.7 liter V8. So there's certainly gonna be some interesting options here. If you want that next level of regeneration where you're certainly not stressing the brakes on the tow vehicle, you may actually want the plug-in hybrid Ram. As with the competition, there are going to be a number of different off-road capable trims, and logically any of the Ram 1500s with four-wheel drive are going to be just fine off-road, but this Rebel is probably going to be the best-selling off-road trim, and it's the only one we were able to sample on some of these trails at this ranch in Texas. Of course, we have the two-speed transfer case, we have the adaptive air suspension, but interestingly, the Rebel gets the low output version of the three liter turbocharged engine. It definitely feels pretty peppy still. Actually, to be honest, in sort of daily driving, just average parking lot maneuvers out on the trail here, you're not really gonna notice that much difference between the 420 horsepower tune and the 540 horsepower tune. You're gonna notice the difference a bit more if you're towing or if you're just romping on the throttle, you need to make it to that freeway exit, etc. That's where you're gonna notice the difference a bit more. One interesting twist with the Rebel is that in addition to not having the high output version of the 3 liter 6, it also doesn't have the variable torque split transfer case. So this is a more traditional unit with 2 high, 4 high, 4 low where the coupling in the center is locked, and 4 auto where it basically locks and unlocks that center coupling. This 3 liter turbo is exactly the right engine at exactly the right time. 
I am gonna shed a few tears over the 5.7 liter Hemi. I'm gonna shed a few more that the 392 never made it under this hood, but this is certainly a drivetrain for the 21st century. It's gonna give you better fuel economy. It's gonna give you better towing capability, better hauling capability, significantly better performance, and lower emissions all at the same time. The V8 was a great drivetrain for the 20th century. This is a great drivetrain for the century going forward. But of course, it's not gonna sound quite as nice as the V8s, and I can completely understand if some folks are not gonna be quite as happy about it. However, I think that if you drive one, a lot of those worries will ease, because for most driving conditions, this is simply a better engine. Let's get to the nitty gritty. How much is the Ram 1500 gonna set you back? Well, clearly more than last year because we get more standard equipment on the Tradesman trim. We get all the active driver assist tech and active safety systems like the adaptive cruise control, front and rear parking sensors, etc. Those are features I really value on the Tradesman trim, but logically the price tag has ratcheted upwards as a result. The destination charge is also pretty hefty. It's $1,995 in addition to the prices that we're going to be talking about. The Tradesman trim starts at $40,275, so definitely more than last year, although on balance with all those safety features standard and of course the newly standard LED headlights, I think it's a reasonable deal. Keep in mind though that the interior has not changed too appreciably on that base trim. We do get the new infotainment system in the dashboard, but the rest of the interior components are pretty similar to last year. One step up from there is the Bighorn and the Lone Star that still has the 3.6 liter V6. That's the red model you saw earlier. That's $44,935. On those two models, the 3-liter inline-six turbocharged engine standard output version is optional, but Ram has not said how much that option will cost you. My expectation is that it's going to be pretty similar to the optional 5.7-liter V8 last year. If you want the 3-liter standard output to be standard, that's going to be in the Rebel for, hold on to your hats, $64,195. That's ostensibly the more off-road capable version, and we're going to get upgraded interior components in that model as well. The Laramie is also going to have the 3 liter standard output engine for $60,030, so you could get that model, spend a little bit less than the Rebel, and get relatively similar feature content on the inside and still 420 horsepower. If you want 540 horsepower in your next pickup truck, you need to step up to the limited Longhorn at least. That's going to be $75,650, and they're calling the limited and limited Longhorn sort of co-trims in that same level, although the limited is just a hair less expensive. Interestingly, while the base two models get the standard 3.6 and the optional 3 liter standard output, there is no trim where the standard output engine is standard and the high output engine is optional. You do have to work all the way up to $75,000 plus destination if you want the 540 horsepower engine tune. If you're interested in the fully loaded Ram 1500, brace yourself because I don't know how much this tungsten will cost you exactly as equipped, but I know that it started over $87,000 plus destination. This model here is likely pushing around $95,000, and your exact price tag is going to depend on which optional color you choose, what additional options you might select inside or on the outside from the factory. There are still a number of options that you can select even on the tungsten trim. On the other hand, it actually probably doesn't crest $100,000 as some people had expected, so we're still really pushing right up against that nearly six-figure mark in this segment. Let me know what you think. Have they done enough to put the Ram 1500 back at the top of this segment, or is there still something missing, something that you'd like to see Ram do for maybe the sixth-generation Ram 1500? For me, I would say it's going to depend on exactly what you want out of your half-ton truck. If you're looking for the best ride quality, some of the best performance numbers, solid handling numbers, and one of the most comfortable interiors, then you definitely should take a look at the Ram 1500. If, however, you want more towing capacity or more payload capacity or you want a V8 engine, then you are going to have to look elsewhere because Ram has not really changed the towing and hauling capacity of the Ram 1500 too much. If you want that next level in towing capacity, Ram, of course, has the Ram Charger coming up soon, but it's not here yet with this particular model. I will say that the 3 liter inline 6 does not have as much engine braking as the 5.7 liter V8 had before it or the optional V8 engines from the competition. That's simply the way smaller displacement turbo engines are. If you are looking for the most luxurious truck in America, it is definitely the new Ram 1500 tungsten, however. 
You're gonna pay a pretty penny for it, but if you're looking for the most comfortable massaging seats in this segment, the nicest interior, the biggest screens, the only passenger screen, etc., you will find all of that in this particular Ram 1500. I'm kind of surprised that in the recent refresh of the F-150 that they didn't take things to quite that next level. Yes, it is nicer inside than it's been before, but it's not this nice. Also, I will say that I think that Ram has done exactly what they needed to do to keep this competitive with the new GMC Sierra Denali. The Sierra Denali has a fantastic interior, and I love its infotainment system. But I think this actually is slightly nicer in some areas. I think there are advantages and disadvantages to both, but I would love to know what you think about all that too. So until then, let me know down there. Stay tuned. Hopefully we'll have one of these at home soon where we can do some towing with it. Let me know. Find me over at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc. And I'll see all of you next week.